Good evening, councillors and staff and members of the public who may be watching and welcome to our agenda Q&A session. I would just remind the councillors that we are live streaming the menu tonight. Attendance and apologies, Mr CEO. I have an apology from uh, Councillor Podovnik who's running late and from Councillor McNamara who is on leave of absence, Mr Mayor. Councillor Scanlon is also um, on leave of absence as well. Okay, thank you, Mr. CEO. And councillors, um, Councillor Podovnik, when she arrives, will be um, joining us electronically. Councillor Richardson is with us electronically, electronically, and so are executive officers, Mr. Jim Coton, Kim Lay, and Mr. Stephen Tan, and also Amanda <coughs> Albright. Okay, councillors, uh, tonight we'll be going through the questions by order of management stream. Okay, sorry, my point. Thank you, Mr. CEO. Um, declarations of financial and proxy interest and interest affecting impartiality. Are there any declarations, Mr. CEO? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Um, Councillor Catalono has expressed an impartiality in item B 2.1. That's the petition you know, requesting nine properties uh, be assessed for heritage value, as uh, she's expressed an impartiality as she's on the executive of the Midland Society. And in item B 3.6, again, um, uh, that's the adoption of the policy on the local planning policy design review and terms of reference. She's expressed an impartiality in that she's on the executive of the Midland Society, Mr Mayor. Um, I haven't expressed an interest in item C 3.1, a financial interest, as I'm currently the CEO. Uh, also, all my executive, that is um, uh, Kim Lay, Stephen Tan, uh, Mark Bishop and Jim Coden have all expressed a co perceived conflict of interest in item C 3.1, Mr Mayor, as well. Also, um, Bryce, Bryce Parry has also expressed an impartiality in item C 3.1 as he's previously involved in labour hire firms, some of who have put their a tender in for the work, Mr Mayor. Also, Councillor Mel Congleton's um, put an interest in in item C 3.3, that's Paradise Keys. He's got a proximity interest as he owns land adjoining the southern section. And Mr Jim Coden has also put uh, an impartiality in, item, in the same item um, that is the one to do with Paradise Keys um, as his mother is in a, in a facility run by Southern Cross Care, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Mr CEO. Any further declarations from either councils or staff? There be none. Thank you. Um, takes us to item four, deputations. Councillors, you would have see, received copies of the deputations and there are a number of deputations. There are seven on item 3.2, one on 3.4, three on 3.8 and 4.1 also has one. And we will now move on to the uh, presentations and motions and so on. So uh, firstly will be uh, the Executive Manager of Planning and Statutory Planning, uh, and Mr. Ru Phil Russell and Mr. Stephen Tan. Mr Tan will be dealing with item 2.1 and Mr Russell with item 3.1, 3.8. So either Mr Tan or Mr Russell, do you wish to address any of those items? Mr Tan, firstly. Thank you, Mr. Tan. Are there any questions of Mr. Tan? On 2.1. Councillor Henderson. If I may, just in regard to the, uh, the aspect of a owner of a property, um, when they are asked the question if they would uh, allow um, uh, the assessment to be made, 
Are they advised that they do not have to um, consent to an assessment? Mr Tan? The, the basic question we would ask is there's a request for assessment of your property. Would you be prepared to grant approval for council to enter the property to, to assess it properly? That's all. Could be yes or no, up to them. Uh, yeah, Mr Mayor, I got that. Uh, but. I feel it's important that uh, people don't get effectively pressured by that question and that they should be advised that they don't have to. Okay. Yes, that, that, that would be the case. We advise them, right, we don't have to, we don't want to. There's no, uh, it's only a petition and the council will decide. Okay. Happy with that. Thank you, Mr. Tent. Councillor Catalano. Oh, thank you. Um, so, do you normally, is it normal policy to, um, when you request for landowners uh, permission to do the assessment, that um, you also let them know that they don't have to do it? Is that normal policy? We will just say, advise them factually that we have a petition for us to assess your property, we've got to get your permission. You know, if, if they say no, we can't force them. I don't want to put on the list. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Tan. Any other further questions on 2.1, councillors? Thank you. Then I'll hand on to Mr. Russell for items 3.1 to 3.8. Mr. Russell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Look. Perhaps it might be uh, easiest. I mean, the material's all in the report. I'm happy just to field any questions that the councillors might have on any of the items. The councillors, questions of Mr Russell? Councillor Kiley? Thank you, Mayor. Through you, my questions relate to 3.3, um, the Responsible Authority Report for the proposed stock feed grain mill. My questions, um, I want to know whether staff are familiar with a Supreme Court um, hearing um, that was on the 30th of March, I believe. I'll just check that now. Uh, in which the outcome, it's a Supreme Court hearing related to 757 Brand Highway, Mouche, in which a, a feed mill was um, accepted by a Midwest Wheat Belt JDAP decision. And however, it, there seems to be a ruling forthcoming through the Supreme Court um, whereby the 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 issue of pr accepting a feed mill in a rural zone um, looks to be at in question and, and highly likely to be um, rejected. Is the staff familiar with that, Mr. Russ? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, the report to the JDAP acknowledges and responds to a submission made on the advertising of this application from Lavin, who I take it are the proponents that have uh, appealed against a JDAP decision of the facility in the Shire of Chittering. What the report says is, is that, um, that it's, we don't know the details precisely of, of that uh, matter. Uh, the applicant or the submitter alleges is that the uh, the issue in question, the proposal and the instruments under which that proposal was approved by the Metro West JDAP and the Shire of Chittering are virtually the same content uh, as, as uh, this proposal and the, our instrument, the local planning scheme. Be that as it may, um, we don't know the details of that. They've asked, they haven't asked that it be refused in terms of the submission. They've asked that the JDAP actually pause and don't make a decision on this. And look, my response to that will be certainly, as I suspected, that the appeal is against a JDAP decision. Uh, if the Metro East JDAP decision wants to have uh, consider uh, the consequences such as it might be of that decision, then it's free to do so. And I would add, but because that decision would have been contested by the State Solicitor's Office on behalf of the JDAP, then the State Solicitor's Office will be in a prime position to advise the Metro East JDAP when this comes before it, whether or not it might be prudent proper to defer 
uh, pending such a decision. It's not, it's not a matter, I think, that necessarily constrains this council in terms of its recommendation. If I, could follow, if I could follow Further on, question? Mayor. Yes, please. Um, I'll cut to our local planning scheme. It talks that there's one, two, three, four points there. I personally cannot see how the approval of a grain mill in this area meets the objectives of rural, general rural zone within the local planning scheme. And I'll point to point A first in... Um, if it's A is to facilitate the use of development of land for a range of productive rural activities, I don't see how that meets the criteria, and B, um, provide for a limited range of compatible support services to meet the needs of the rural community, but, but which will not prejudice the development of land elsewhere, which is, specific, which is specifically zoned for such development, and C, ensure the use of the development of land does not prejudice rural amenities and to promote and the enhancement of rural character. And to D, to ensure that development and land management are sustainable with reference to the capability of land and the natural resource values. I'd, I'd like to know how you have concluded that a feed mill would be suitable in a general rural zone given that there are clear indications there that it doesn't enhance the amenity of the area, it doesn't promote the rural character, uh, it, it would prejudice land adjacent to the site, given that there would be a buffer zone in place. I, I'd still like more in information about how we concluded that a feed mill is not, would not be con uh, is considered appropriate where... I would suggest it's probably more appropriate in a light industrial area. Can, can you... Mr Russell, do you want to comment on that? Or you uh, think uh, comment thank you, Mr the Mayor. I would, I would hope that the focus of the report has succeeded in spelling out all the reasons why the staff are of the view that this is consistent with the objectives of general rural zoning. Um, I think the focus should be, and it's on a feed lot. It takes grain, raw produce, from our wheat belt state and it produces out of that meal feed for livestock livestock is an agricultural production aspect of again uh, our, our state um, so the question might arise is okay well are we are we are we taking uh, grain uh, and, so, and, and the objective of the general rural zone is to have an industry that supports uh, the economic base of a region. It's been put to me, I suppose, you could formulate that question as to whether that means that it should be uh, supporting the economic base of the Bullsbrook locality within the Shire of Swan or whether you can read that objective to extend a bit further. But whether uh, you look at that or not, uh, we've taken the view that if you're producing a product that is intended to feed livestock. It is an, adv it is, it is an advancement and furtherance of uh, a livestock base to the rural economy that we, will, we do have to some extent in Bullsbrook and surrounds. So that's, that's the reason why we've said, well, look, you can make a case it fits into that in terms of those top two objectives. The other thing, of course, that a, the, the, the design requires is that you're not adversely prejudicing the rural character and amenity of the area. And we've endeavoured to set out in the report all the contentions made as to how this facility might impact on rural character and amenity, and that's principally through their emissions. Now, in no particular order, uh, people have raised concerns with uh, odour, with noise, um, and, and with um, uh, traffic and dust. Now, certainly uh, in no particular order, the proposal, and, and look, some people have suggested or expressed some concerns with some of the animal product additives that might generate odour, and that's understandable in the submissions, but the proponent has made it quite clear that there are, there are no... Uh, blood and bone or other type additives that will that will produce odour and that this ought to be really a nautilus facility. And there's no reason for us to contest that. In relation to dust, they're going to ensure that, that, that this will be 
all the appropriate measures. Most of the stuff's contained within sheds. A lot of the machinery is enclosed and they will have all the normal safeguards around all of that, such as they are. In relation to noise, OK, we have accepted that they haven't really demonstrated any noise modelling, but they can do so uh, through a subsequent plan. And in relation to traffic, well, um, the, the numbers of vehicle movements are there and it's intended really for this facility to be a short hop between access off Morley Road, down Mushay South Road and across through and linking up to, 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 to North Link. And in relation to visual, um, most of the buildings, whilst they're sizable, are low scale relatively in this landscape. And the question really has got to be put. You ask the average West Australian whether a grain silo in this state is out of context with our rural character, I'd be very surprised if you had too many people that said that it was. Um, the other thing we need to understand, I suppose, is that this is, a, this is a location that is fairly sparse in terms of the resident population surrounding it. There's about five houses or so, and most of those houses, in fact, all of those houses, which are the nearest sensitive receivers, are over 500 metres away. So given the, given, given the nature of the distances involved, the fact that it's not going to generate any odour and that the dust and noise can all be managed as conditions. And you've got to remember this facility will need to be, need a dual approval, we'll get one, or needs to get one under the Planning Act from the JDAP, but also needs to get a works approval and licence from the, uh, the relevant environmental agency. So there'll be a double up on controls there. Again, it's not going to be it's not going to be a floodlit a grain silo, but it's also going to be a, proposed to be situated in the context of you're going to have the Northlink proposal running through there, which will have all the infrastructure and embankments and lighting associated with that. And within all of that context, we're of the view that it it, it, it does match uh, those objectives. Uh, obviously, parties can make a contrary case, but we feel that it satisfies the objectives of the. Uh, of the general rural zone, and uh, there is no reason to, to refuse it. Yep. Further question? Thank you, Mayor. Why would we need a buffer zone, or why would they need a buffer zone if it was uh, promoting the rural character and amenity? There's a couple of things. There's no suggestion. There, there isn't a buffer zone. There isn't a buffer zone. The guidance document talks about nominal distances or separation from sensitive receivers such as houses. This proposal, by virtue of its separation in excess of 500 metres from the nearest residential dwellings, meets the nominal guidelines in the relevant document for a separation distance from this type of facility. So it's compliant with that instrument. You're familiar with uh, chicken farms in Caversham and Dayton that have been there for many years, that have buffer zones in place that have caused a lot of distress in the community. Why would this uh, development be no different given the growth corridor is extending up into that area? Through Mr Mayor, I've got to correct a misunderstanding that many people have. There are no, I can tell you this is an absolute fact, there is no statutory buffer zone on any land under the City of Swan Local Planning Scheme number 17 and neither was there under Scheme 9. There is none. If you want to see what an actual statutory buffer zone is, I will refer you to the instruments that apply down to the land south of Perth here in areas such as Quinana. It is a state legislated buffer put in place through local planning schemes. It is an understandable but nonetheless misconception that the public, many people in the public have about buffer zones. The guidance document talks about a separation distance. A buffer zone is a donut hole in a planning scheme that sits in there and that is endorsed through the legislative process uh, of, a, of, of, a, of formulating a scheme or a scheme amendment. We have no buffer zones in Swan, and in the time I've been here, we have never had them. Never had them, Mr Mayor. We can put them in if you wish, um, but what we're dealing with here is a recommended best practice separation distance that it's even important to qualify that even the guidance documents say even if you have a nominal 500 metre buffer zone it doesn't mean or, or separation distance the, I'm falling into the trap myself separation distance 
The documents say that you may be able to reduce that separation distance if you can manage the impacts of the potential emissions. And invariably for these things, it's, it's the same stuff. It's odour, it's noise, it's dust, it's light uh, and other particle emissions. So, so the, the, docu the, the proposal is compliant with the nominal separation distances, but there is no buffer zones around this. Thank you, Mr. Through you, Mayor, Mr Russell, you might want to call it a separation distance, but I think the community are familiar with buffer zone. Effectively, I don't know what the difference is going to be, but I'll go to another question. Uh, is there a shortage of industrially zoned land in the Bullsbrook area? I would say not, given that we have um, a, a, a large chunk of it in the South Bullsbrook industrial area. Um, uh, but what I would say around that South Bullsbrook industrial area, as Council would be well aware. Uh, it is an area where there is uncertainty yet around development contributions that would apply to development of that land. And of course, uncertainty for developers or investors and in industries is not a good thing necessarily. And there is also questions around the appropriate provision of the infrastructure, which Council is aware of that we've got uh, regional infrastructure such as Stock Road. So there isn't a shortage of zone land, but the question might be, is there a shortage of ready to roll, ready to use, provided with infrastructure industrial zone land? And the answer, I think, to that question would be at the moment, yes. Another question. The, you brought up the issue of blood and bone versus meat meal. Now, it's true that blood and bone won't be used, but that's a separate product to meat meal. Now, this is an important distinction for the community and for councillors to understand that blood and bone is a separate product and will not be used in the in the added, as an additive for uh, non-ruminant animals, but for the non-ruminant animals that up to 40 tonnes a day will be produced out of this site, there's uh, quite a considerable percentage of meat meal which will be added to the, to the product. Can you elaborate on that? Because I, I find it a little bit deceptive to say that we know blood and bone used, but there will be meat meal. Mr Russell? Well, I'm not sure I'm in a position to answer the details of the precise uh, recipe or ingredients that goes into the pro to, to, to what's going to come out in terms of these, these feed pellets. Suffice to say that, that when the application was originally submitted, the application made reference to the addition of uh, some tallow. Now, this is not tallow that they would be manufacturing on the site, but tallow is an imported ingredient. Subsequently, that was advertised, and that, that I understood generated some concern. I don't know whether people are distinguished between tallow or blood and bone, um, but certainly the proponent has indicated no blood and bone, if that is something that gives off odour. There are certainly other additives that the, that the report has taken from the application to say, for example, that they add to the, the uh, milled grain, whether that includes, uh, well, as I said, from, from recollection, that was uh, um, various elements of... Uh, canola oil and other bits and pieces that add into that, but that is, a, that is a small quantity. And nonetheless, the, the applicant is suggesting that whatever those additives are, at whatever quantity that goes into the milled grain, it will not be producing odour, and we've got no cause to, to contest that. Well, um, just a couple more, Mayor, if, through, if that's OK. Uh, just on that point, the reports are that 10 to 15 per cent of meat meal would be added to the product and that would be occurring 24-7. I'm just concerned about the operation 24-7, the impact that would have on the rural amenity um, with truck movements and the like. Does, do you think that's a, adding or enhancing the rural amenity by having an operation 24-7 with truck movements throughout the night? Through Mr Mayor, well look, I think most people would say that one of the characteristics of a rural environment is night time quiet. And I would agree with that. And, and yes, a facility that I suppose is there uh, that might that, that would be having uh, truck movements through it, yes, uh, that that will have some degree of uh, you might say intrusion into what might be an otherwise very quiet nighttime environment. But within the context of what will be a major regional road imminently about to be opened in terms of Northlink, you're going to probably be having. Uh, and it's, that's the intention of it, large freight movements up and down that road at all hours, which, as you said, is, is, is what it's designed for. So I suppose the context of truck movements to this premises 
within the context of up and down truck movements and other traffic 24/7 around a major regional road such as Northlink, you're going to have you're going to have a, you're not going to be having by virtue of that project a very uh, a quiet nighttime environment in this part of Ballsbrook, given that this facility is not going to be too far away from the Northlink proposal. So I suppose it's going to be it's going to be the amenity of this location in terms of nighttime noise is probably going to be impacted in any event. Just one last one. You, you talked about agricultural production. Um, City of Swan doesn't grow wheat. I mean, they'll bring, they can bring it into the site, but City of Swan in the Bullsbrook area doesn't grow grain up there as, as much as I know. Um, and you talked about supporting the economic base of the region. Um, would, would you think that if we were approving a tractor factory, making we place that would make tractors that could be used in the rural environment, would that be a suitable uh, development in that rural zone? Given that the tractors would be used back in the rural area and would suit the, uh, as you said, it would suit the economic base of the region, would, an, would a tractor factory be suitable? Uh, with respect, Mr Mayor, that's a needlessly speculative question. I don't know. Well, I, I don't know. I, I think it does relate because it's a similar sort of industrial. Yes. Let effect. Mr. Russell answer the question if you want. Okay, and we have to deal with the application before us. That's correct, Councillor Lucas. Councillor Henderson. Uh, sorry, Councillor Catalano. I think you had a question. Or yours been covered. I'll just finish, Mayor. I'll just uh, foreshadow a a, a, a a what do we call a refusal for the um, for the application. Thank you, Councillor Catalano. Thank you. Um, with the like reference to that Supreme Court case, do you know what the grounds were um, for the appeal? Through Mr Mayor, I know nothing about the details uh, of it. Um, so no, I, I can't other than clearly it's, a, it's an appeal against the state, the JDAP, and this will be a decision by the JDAP. So I think by the time it goes to the JDAP, the members of the JDAP will have the benefit of any legal advice from the state solicitors on this matter. But no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm afraid I don't know any of the, the details of it. Councillor Anderson. What's that, Hawaii Five-0 or something? There's always one. Whatever. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, Mayor, I'd like to thank uh, Mr Russell for giving me more than an hour of his time a couple of days ago to go over this in great detail. Um, just as a, a, a point uh, in terms of fin financial implications in the report, it says there could be up to a $60,000 implication. Well, that should be removed from the report because, in fact, um, this is just a recommendation to the, um, the JDAP and it would be the, the state uh, that would end up being uh, the, the one having to defend if that's the case. Um, but um, in regard to the, um, uh, the issue of um, how do you define rural and how do you define um, rural industry, uh, I'm of the view, having had that discussion with Mr Russell, that um, the definition hasn't been met and uh, I asked him at that time to prepare an alternate recommendation for me around option two uh, to, um, to refuse uh, with some additions. So that's already in train. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, any further questions, Councillor Mr Russell, on any of those planning items? Well, he, Mr Russell has 3.1 through 3.8. Oh, yes, OK, Councillor Kalano. Oh, thank you. On 3.6, um, that's the adoption of the um, design review panel. Um, I've got a question that's about... Me. Oh, oh, sorry. Thank you, Mr Tan. My apologies, Councillor Catalano. You've given some wrong advice there. Mr Tan? All right. OK. Yep. So um, it says here on page 124 that because what I note is that um, what went out for advertising was that this panel would um, assess developments, applications of two or more stories in height. And that went out for advertising. So um, obviously... Uh, that's what people thought um, was going to happen. 
And it appears now that um, since it's come back from advertising that um, staff have decided that it's going to be now uh, an assessment panel that's only going to assess developments that are more than three or more storeys in height. Um, and I notice on page 124, the reason for that is public feedback. So um, what public feedback did you get and where did it come from? Because I don't actually see it in these submissions. That, that the height should be, have been raised from two storeys to three storeys. The submission raises various types of development, whether it's <coughs> group dwelling or multiple dwelling, but multiple dwelling could be two story, three story, or more than that. Multiple dwelling, by definition, is one above another layer. There was uh, discussion among uh, uh, staff how best to uh, make a decision rather than two-story, you're going to get a lot of group dwelling development, there's two-story terrace housing, which is quite common, and uh, most of them, uh, the, the, the design guidelines would not really apply, because two-story sometimes, right, in a, in a group dwelling is fairly innocuous in terms of their, their, their design, but mainly when you start looking at multiple dwelling, generally about three storey or more, that's where the impact on the street scale is greater than a normal two storey uh, building or townhouses. That's a call made by city staff in discussing all the submissions you see. Uh, I haven't got all the submissions with me, but I can make them available to Further question, Councillor. Yes, Lowe. thanks. I just want to. Okay, thanks. So, in, if it's if staff made this decision, why didn't they make it before it was actually presented to council and before it went out to advertising that it was going to be? It would be better to have three stories and more, and not two stories and more, because it seems that the staff now have um, kind of made this decision after the advertising period. And actually, the public weren't aware that staff were going to make that decision. So why wasn't that decision made before it went out for advertising? Mr Ten. So, to you, Ms Mayor, generally, right, when you just put the policy out, right, we felt looking at what we've got, maybe two stories ought to be considered. But if the council feels strongly about the three-story limit, right, starting as a benchmark, you can revert back to two stories. You know, it just means you're going to get more uh, uh, basic two story type developments of when you have to go to development two stories that get referred to, to the panel. And uh, it costs, it's time consuming, financial, and stuff. So I'm happy if the council decides that anything more than two story and or more, you refer to, to the panel. Fine. But I'm just, we, we had a long discussion looking at all the submissions, and we felt that most of the group dwelling development, two story, are just standard development, nothing of significance in terms of the design, the impact. The impact on the street scale is not that great. Further question, Councillor Gellar? Oh, yes, thank you. So, um, didn't really answer my question as to why staff had that discussion after it was advertised as two stories um, and why that discussion and decision was made after. But um, I'll move on and that is, um, so 
actually, how many development applications in the city of Swan um, are there, uh, or have there been in the last 12 months, um, of three storeys and more? I mean, a percentage, a rough percentage, ballpark figure that you um, are aware of, or that, that um, your staff are aware of, Mr um, Russell is aware of. Mr. Russell? Uh, th thank you, Mr. Mayor. You're certainly very little. In fact, thinking about it, if you're talking about three story, uh, you'd be lucky probably to have five, I think, uh, over the last 12 months. Yeah, likewise. Okay. And, um, yeah. Thanks for that. Okay. Yeah. Councillor Henderson. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, in regard to the policy, uh, the design review policy, page 137, uh, I was looking at the, uh, the panel members, part uh, 4.3. Um, I don't see any consideration, or I may have missed it, uh, that the chair would have a casting vote, perhaps? Just want to be sure we put the details in place. Is there a consideration for that? Um, Mr Tan? Please, Mayor, it's not about in the census. I mean, uh, the, the, the chair, the chair will discuss, discuss all the options. And it's generally, in my, my understanding, from the experience of other local government having a design panel, it's more of a consensus view, and the chair would have to endorse it. You know, because it's only a recommended advisory committee. Uh, if there's any any in the event of the appeal set, we will engage the chair to be the spokesperson for that recommendation. So it's, it's not about that being a, a chair having the custody rules. It's about being consensus, like a we cannot get uh, not making a decision. architects, so I have a fair view. Everybody has a, 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 a point of view in terms of, you know, architecture is in the eye of the beholder. And you can't get all two architects at least share the same view, but they do discuss what would be the best outcome for a particular design. And my understanding that from, from watching uh, other local government operating the design review panel is mainly a consensus point of view, and the chair will be the spokesperson for it. Um, for Mayor, if I may. Um, yeah. Um, I, I really do think we should add under 4.2 uh, that the chair has a casting vote. Uh, these committees are making a recommendation to the council, so uh, and uh, we we have these committees for a purpose, and hopefully we get good results uh, from those uh, those committees. So I think we should have that. Um, uh, the other question is: um, Is there any intention? to make full minutes available of these uh, meetings to councillors? Mr Tan? Yes, that's possible. That, that will be made available. And if so, uh, would uh, we may have something contentious. Uh, would there be uh, the need for the uh, votes to be recorded? Mr Tan? No, 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 no. that, that, that can be done, Mr Mayor. Bearing in mind, right, like, it's only a recommendation, they only advise you. It's an advisory committee. Like, uh, you know. Thank you, uh, of course. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Tan. Uh, I understand it's uh, advice, and I get all that. But, but hopefully, as I said, hopefully uh, the advice would be um, the, the sound. And I think if you have the detail, you can make a judgment based on that. The other question is, um, like uh, an example of Swan Valley Planning Committee, we're finding that sometimes it takes a long time to get something through 
uh, the system to uh, to get a result because of the multiple tiers of process. What sort of delays would you expect um, to see through this process? Would it be something similar to what we see with the Swan Valley Planning Committee? Mr. Uh, with respect, uh, Councillor, I would hope not. Uh, we would uh, expedite this because uh, they could make a recommendation for 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 the city staff to prepare a report to the council. Some very planning committee is independent. Whether or not they made a decision, city would have a, our own report, you know, having the gut for, for the... Uh, some very planning committee are, are obliged to provide response within certain time periods. Sometimes they achieve that. But this is internally run by the city staff, and we will ensure that there, will be, there won't be any unnecessary delay in the decision and recommendation. So just to finish on that, um, uh, I'd really like a description of unnecessary delay. Are we talking um, processes in parallel? Or are we talking about one thing being determined, then another? And in other words, I really want to get an idea of how much additional time. Mr. Ted? Uh, Phil? Uh, Ms. Mayor, I think that on notice, and no. I'll well, clarify that. Okay. Mr. Russell, you got an opinion on it? I do have an opinion, Mr. Mayor. Look, um, both Mr. Tan, myself, and Mr. Van der Linde, when we were looking at this, we visited the uh, town of Victoria Park, and we observed a, a des design review panel meeting that they had done. And it's horses for courses, of course. We've got to remember that. The particular example that they were do are going through. This was, I think, its fourth iteration at a meeting. Now, I think, in all honesty, the, 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 process, the process basically says they recommend three meetings, a conceptual uh, proposal that you, that you lodge before you lodge your development application, that then gets a preliminary sort of feedback, you tweak that, the proponent lodges their development application, the clock starts, you do all of that, and then post all of that. But depending on the nature of the proposal, it really depends on how, how uh, well intentioned the proponent is to take on board the requested modifications or tweaks to the design that the panel recommends. Um, but look, certainly the Victor Park example was one that where that it was their fourth iteration, I, and, and the, the, it had been there some time, I suppose. There's no doubt, though, that 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 with these things, that they can take time. And in actual fact, there was a uh, a recent SAT decision on a proposal. Admittedly, this was a high scale facility in the city of South Perth, but that had gone through the ringer. And I suppose the question might be, it'll be an interesting one in these times if we're trying to have ex expedited economic development with fast track approvals, how a design critique arrangement is, it, 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 there is no way of, of underestimating that it is going to add an extra layer that you need to work through, whether it's three meetings, four, or you get it right in two. So the, it, it, I, I, in all honesty, it will t add some extra time to the process dependent upon how great the design is up front and how the panel whether the panel thinks you've ticked everything off you go okay mr tan sorry just just to, uh, i think mr tan's yeah, got okay. a, had a comment on it council mr tan any further comment for, for, for mr. Mayor, we inserted a new clause in 3.21 talks about encouraging we strongly recommend to have a pre Lodgement uh, a meeting with the review panel, and that would basically, uh, when the time comes to the, uh, the, the the DA lodge, right, they would have addressed some of the concern from uh, uh, from the advice from the panel. I mean, that's something that we put in, right, based on the submission from uh, I think it's from the uh, Office of Government Architects recommending that uh, the best thing to get experience is to sit down and talk to the proponent about uh, what, what, what their, their proposal is all about and the panel give some guidance as to, to suggest what would be the best outcome uh, 
and they're going to give consideration to some of these pointers. And uh, that's a new clause that's put into Councillor Henderson. Um, thank you. And, and look, I understand that this is a rubbery number. Um, uh, can I have a worst case of how many weeks or months that these processes might be extended by? Mr. Russell, perhaps. Uh, agree, Mr. Mayor. I would say, I would say, it could be a month. Yeah. Thirty basis yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, based on your further comment, you'd be moving or turn it just to correct that four point three. Councillor Colley. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I just draw Councillor's oh, attention. Councillor Colley first, that's all. Oh, sorry. I do have you, Councillor. I draw Councillor's attention to 3.7 on page 136. It talks about the dismissal of a member, um, but there's no mention there of a any undeclared or significant conflict of interest being a reason why they could be dismissed. However, we, we do cover. On, under on page 139 conflict of interest but there's no but that doesn't make it grounds for dismissal I just wondered if do we need to amend that on the night or how do we is somebody just drawing that to council's attention is, is that something that's been overlooked Stephen maybe if you could answer Mr. Tan. No, I don't get it either. I'll draw it. I'm looking at 3.7. 3.7, right? Uh, it says, right, uh, that the member is not making a positive contribution to the design of the That would be when the, the, the other members or the chair of the member would, would have an understanding in their participation. Because if they know that... Sorry, Stephen. Can I interrupt for a second? On page 139, you've got conflict of interest, and it's obviously an important issue. However, I don't want to get the panel into a, an argument whereby they might be up for dismissal because they haven't adhered to declaring a conflict of interest. I'd just like to see conflict of interest, not undeclared or significant conflict of interest... Um, being a reason for dismissal. That's all. Pretty simple, I would have thought. I'll leave that one and probably propose an amendment on the evening. The uh, other question through you, Mayor, is um, 3.7. The council or chief executive officer, as its delegated representative, may terminate the appointment of any member. I'm, I'm just wondering, should we say one or the other? Are we, are we confusing the issue by allowing either or? Should we just make it the council? Professional people, 
and it would be it would be inappropriate if it goes public. Whereas you know, CEO can make that decision and can be confidential. The concern is anything you put in in the council forum or even in the confidential item, the resolution is public. Are we not looking to be transparent in this process? I think what Mr Tan's saying that well, if we've got a professional architect or something, it's dismissed, it may be detrimental to their career outside their involvement. Um, so I wouldn't want to bring a highly respected architect or a lawyer into disrepute. But because he hasn't contributed, I don't think it's a... But on the other hand, I don't want a highly respected architect coming in, sitting on that panel and making decisions when, they've, when, when they may have a conflict of interest. Oh, yeah, but then conflicts of interest, they would have to declare separate. This is about someone not doing their, their job. It's no different than sitting on an outside committee on council never turning up. It's a non-contributor, but I think if they're removed, we don't want to cause them any harm outside. Um, yeah, Councillor Johnson, you're next. Uh, yeah, um, actually, I could carry on on this one. How would the situation arise where a highly respected architect find themselves in a position where they were going to be sacked? How would that happen? A, B, and C are 3.4, yeah. That's what it says. Oh, but, but sure, surely they'd, they'd know not to do that. Anyway, that, that's it. I've got to let me carry on with a different question. On. Where does the recommendation um, from the design panel go to? I thought it went to the developer, but now I'm hearing it's going to council. It's Mr. Russell, it comes to council, I believe. Mr. Tan. Uh, no. The, the recommendation is on, on, the, on the project, right, from the design panel, is to have regard for the state government policy on the best practice on on on, on the high rise development and that recommendation right that, that the intent of this panel is in the in the, uh, the discussion process pre or discussion is to make sure that the development application, when it's formally launched, satisfies all the requirements of the state government policy and also council scheme. And the, 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 the reason those SPT seven was uh, introduced was because there were a lot of cheap uh, got multiple dwelling development all over term right, that are of poor uh, aesthetic value and and no consideration to the street, streetscape and the uh, urban design. That's why this policy brought brought up by the state down to ensure that density development has a standard. And the design panel will Assess any application based on the policy established by the state government, and to ensure that right, whatever lodged and approved or considered by the council has met those uh, uh, requirements of the state government. I think your question, Councillor Johnson, was once the design panel has given an opinion, where does it go? Yes. Does it uh, go to council or back to the developer? Goes to council. My understanding is, Mr. Tan. I didn't. I didn't hear that. My original understanding was that it went. It went to the developer, and the council doesn't see the recommendation of the design panel. No, no, that's not. If I'm a, if I'm an applicant, I lodge a plan pre-lodge from either the city or city design panel, and say that the design this is my design. Do I meet the standard? If they meet the standard, no, why? And they modify the plan, and then once the tenant is happy, they recommend that, that the plan is consistent with all the guidelines for the state government, and that recommendation of that project becomes the recommendation to the city when we determine the application. Instead of the city staff determining the plan 
put before the council. This is basically getting professional advice independent of the city staff uh, 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 ability to assess multiple dwelling type development. Uh, we don't have the, the skill set in, in all our planners. We don't have urban design specialists, we don't have architecture uh, design for, uh, uh, skills. So this panel would, on behalf of the council, ensure that the plan that's lodged for council determination will meet all the requirements under the SPP policy. The recommendation by the panel is to the council. All right. Okay, so that, that's a bit different to my original understanding. So when we get the report, um, the, the city planner's report comes to council, it will include the recommendation of the uh, design panel. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, okay. Long way is the question. So. Okay. All right. Um, next question is about something that I think was on page 124. It's one of the great things about being a councillor is you get to ask these questions. So. Page 124, 3.1, referral to design review panel. In the reason for changing from two storage to three storage, it says public feedback result raised concerns that the design review process will cause additional red tape. May I ask what is red tape? Because I don't know what it is. Mr. Tan. Basically, right. Basically, right. Like, 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 Mr. Russell indicated. We don't get many three-story dwellings. The bulk of the good dwellings are two stories. The, you know, if you start referring Mr. Tan, is there a short answer to what is red tape? What, what is red tape? That's what is red tape? Is there a short answer? The bureaucratic process would probably be a pretty good answer. Yeah. Bureaucratic process yeah, right. and delays. Yeah. yeah. But, but how, how would... Um, two stories or three stories make make a difference. The same bureaucracy would apply, or the same red tape bureaucratic process would apply to two stories and three stories. So it's, it's exactly identical. So I, don't, I still don't really know what. I mean, that's what we're about here, isn't it? Bureaucracy. bureaucracy? Well, well, except my understanding is two stories a standard um, house can be built in two stories, and that that means that every every two story house will be going to that panel. So you're going to include a lot more buildings going into that and is that what you want well, are you true, prepared to add, add to that in both cases it says excluding single residential dwellings so single residential dwellings are excluded, excluded from the design not two story dwellings uh, no it says single residential dwellings not single story residential dwellings yeah. that's always been my understanding is that single houses don't apply it does not apply to a single house three, three, three is the single residential under the scheme is a single house Yep. Yeah, that's correct. So it can, be, can two that be two stories or single story? Precisely. You didn't answer my question. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> well, at least we're all so, agreed on so, that. So, Stephen, the question <laughs> is, every two-story house, if, if the council changes it, the policy, and makes every two-story building, that includes two-story houses. Am I correct or aren't we not? No. No. Yes, a two-story single dwelling. Yes, thank you. But it, it says excluding single residential dwellings. It's the clarification is here, Stephen. Is a two-story house a single dwelling exempt from the design panel, or does it have to go to the design panel? Single story. Two-story and above. Single residence, not group dwelling. Two-story single dwelling. <coughs> Any context. A single story is a single house. A two-story or could be three-story. Okay. Stephen, the question is: Does a Stephen does a two-story residential dwelling, not a group dwelling, a residential dwelling, need to come to the design panel? Can you clarify that, please? No, out. That is not the case. Correct? No. Okay. Good. Right. Thank you. That clarifies that. Right. Any further questions, Councillor Pling? Yeah, yeah, yeah Mr. Mel, I still don't think we got got to the bottom of this. Yeah, I still still want to understand about red tape, but 
a lot of red tape it's in this still, room, it's still, it's, suggest- still, it's still not clear. What it says there is as clear as a bell. It says development that is two or more storeys in height, excluding single residential dwellings. So it means if you've got a three-storey building and it's a single residential dwelling, then the, this policy does not apply to it. That's what it says. So, yeah, that, that's my... That's, so that's, it's written I and just it's, want to clarify you know, that. And obviously, from feedback received... That's where the recommendation to go to three stories okay. and above. But it's uh, ex- so that can be a three-story single residential dwelling. It would not apply to. Okay. All right, Councillor Congerton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This, I think it's going round and around and around and around. So the clarity for me, I think, Mr. Tan, is that if you are doing a multiple development site of two stories or more. There's a requirement to go to the design panel. As an owner of a block of land building a single story and or a two story and or a three story and or a four story, because there are no height limitations that I've been told on a number of occasions, that would not be required to go to the design panel. Simple yes or no, please. Yes or no, Mr. Ten. Oh. No, Stephen, you didn't answer the question. You're correct. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Thank you. Um, so, you know, if if, um, if this if this gets approved as for three stories and over, um, so will city staff be doing the consideration of the state government design um, policy um, for two storeys, will, sta- will the staff be doing that consideration instead of the panel? Because that consideration still has to be done, doesn't it? Short answer, Mr Ten. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. So um, what's the benefit of uh, loading up staff with uh, having to make that consideration for two-storey buildings over this panel uh, making that consideration for two-storey buildings. What's the benefit of actually um, the panel not doing it? Short answer, Mr Ten. Mr Russell. Thank you, Mr Mayor. The short answer is less red tape or regulation, less time delays going to a panel, a more expedient and, compun- uh, and straightforward assessment for a lower level, uh, less consequential development. OK, but more work for staff. In my opinion, at that at that scale of the proposals that you would not be referring to a design review panel, it's fairly perfunctory and it wouldn't challenge any uh, planner conversant with state planning policy uh, in this instrument, no. And it'd be the same work you do now. But then that'd apply to the, to the panel as well. The, the ease with which you guys can assess it, they could similarly do the same. Mayor, through you, Mr Mayor, going back to the, the, the answer I provided previously and going using the analogy of red tape, if you follow a process where you refer a proposal first to a design review panel for a concept, then to a formal meeting and then a post-meeting, as he indicated, that will invariably take longer for those types of proposals than it would for the city dealing with it, absolutely, certainly. Hello. Councillor John, you had a last question on this item. I've, I've got quite a few questions on it because uh, it's quite relevant to, to Midland, actually. I guess the first question I've got really goes back to the red tape nonsense. Look, if red tape is a bad thing, as given here, and therefore we've adjusted it, um, surely the whole design review panel is red tape and therefore a bad thing. So why are we doing it? Oui. All right, OK, I've, I've uh, stated something very obvious, have um, I guess the next question then is, goes to a more serious point. In Midland, uh, we have a, a large number of um, two-storey blocks of flats that are being shoehorned onto very small blocks of land in close proximity to one another, and there doesn't appear to be a, a satisfactory 
design pa pattern that is uh, resulting in a satisfactory, maintainable, livable outcome. I guess, I guess the question is, given the majority of these buildings that are going up uh, are two stories and have, shall we say, very unusual design features that don't look very crash hot to me, surely we should be including, uh, you know, would, would the staff not think we should actually include two stories? Well, Councillor, can I suggest if you think that's appropriate, move an amendment to when we come to next week and you can move it back to two storeys and we'll prove it. Well, I can do that, Mr Mayor, I'm seeking professional advice on whether they think it's a good idea. Well, it's up to, up to us, Councillor. I'm, I know it's up to us, but I'm just seeking some advice from Mr Russell, for instance, whether he thinks it would be a good idea to apply it to two storeys. Well, I, mean, I don't he's, think that's he's, he's a professional question. You're asking Mr. Russell an opinion. We're the ones making the judgment on it. Yeah, I know, but I'm, I'm want, I often ask for Mr. Russell's opinion because I, I value it because he's an expert planner. Whereas it says here, public feedback uh, raised uh, a concern about red tape. We don't really know where that came from. So I'd like some advice from a professional planner as to whether it would be a good idea to apply this to two stories. Mr. Tan. You might recall, Council, when we adopted to do this, we said we would not charge yep. for that privilege. So every time they meet, it costs us money. Yep. Right. Any further questions of Mr Tan or Mr Russell? Any other items? Uh, through you, Mayor, yes, the delegated authority, um, I'm just in, I've got an inquiry today about um, 441 Park Street. Is that an application currently for a daycare centre? Is that an application that was made under delegated authority, or is it yet to be decided? I think, Phil, that was one a few, few minutes ago, didn't it? Which one was that? 441 uh, Park. Three, Mr. Mayor, the CA is correct. That was the one that, uh, that um, the, uh, um, well, the council refused. Fused, and it's going to Jada. Yeah, it's going to um, the SAC. Thank you, yes. Thank you. Councillor Catalano, you had a question? Oh, no, that's Same one. OK, we'll get to that. Councillor uh, Johnson? Yeah, yeah, Mr Mayor, just to, just to comment on what you told me earlier about there are no fees, it says on page 121, for additional meetings, charge the applicant $1,700 for the full cost of design review panel meeting. And they also have to put up a $5,100 design review bond. So, you know, it's, it's, there, there is an element of the developers paying for this as well. Yeah, Thank you. Okay. Any further questions of the planners? No further questions. We'll move on now to um, Executive Manager Stakeholder Relations and Ms Lay. Any questions, Councillor? You wish to talk to anything, Ms Lay, or just take questions? Thank you. 
Questions of Ms. Lay, Councillor Johnson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, uh, yeah, Kim, um, just just looking at the uh, net operating result in the statement of comprehensive income, I see that there is a uh, a positive uh, or good variance of four million seven hundred and ninety eight thousand um, dollars. That seems quite positive, but I guess it has to be compared with the same period last year. Do you happen to know how it compares with the pre the uh, April 2019. Slate. I'll take that on notice and get back to the Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Colley. Mayor, this question relates to one of the um, submitted questions by the public from uh, Miss Karen Moat, and it relates to the payments for sidings car park profit share. Can I just ask a question in relation to that to Miss Lay? If I recall, wasn't it answered in the I, I just don't f fully understand it in respect of um, are we st still partaking in a profit share or when the MRA hands back facilities to the city, do we fully take over this profit share or do we still share with the MRA going forward? That was my only question. Ms. Lay? That's the count. That's... Who wants once, to answer that? CEO? Once, once the current arrangement... Um, that's the current arrangement. Once the MRA move on, um, the prof there won't be any profit share. I think that's that's the outcome. Does it come to us? Yes. But well, we have other parking issues in that area we have to deal with. Thank you. Any further questions, Councillor Parry? Yeah, just one quick question, Mr Mayor. Um, Ms Leahy, um, in regards to page 192, in regards to the trade debtors, that $5.1 million invoice, is that a once-off or is that... Anything that will be continued or anything else like that? Ms. Lay? Okay. No further questions, Ms. Lay? Thank you, Ms. Lay. Now move on to uh, Executive Manager of Operations, Mr. Coton. Are you with us? Um, some specific issues in the deputy 
conversation about it has to be statistic. Um, in this location the last five years, 100 metres either side, there have been um, three actors, none of which were related to the crossover that we're actually in the other carriage one. Um, and the, the deputation did include um, information on an accident, but that was um, presumably minor, so it wasn't actually reported as, a, as an incident. Um, the other thing was mentioned in the deputation was the fall on the We have had the um, an assessment done by independent agricultural investment that the tree is in good health and structurally sound. And again, you know, trees do crop limbs, and the fact that a tree has dropped the limb is not um, on its own um, reason to necessarily remove it. The tree's been in place for many years. The people who are complaining about it moved in 2017, so the tree was certainly there with that. Um, when they did move in, and the, the staff believe that there are adequate mitigation measures that can be put in place by having the people um, drive out of their driveway for the road and reverse the Thank you, Mr. Cate. Councillor Henderson, you got a question? Question. Um, thank you. Um, can I be absolutely clear? And it's in the report, I believe. Um, Main roads uh, believe this is a safety hazard. Mr. Cate. Yeah, it doesn't comply with it doesn't comply with Main Road guidelines. That's correct. So, uh, just to be absolutely clear, how can we have our cake and eat it too? It's a good question for you, Mr. Cate. Well, it's a guideline. It's not. Thank you, Mr. Coton. Uh, um, Mayor, um, I'll, I'll be moving a recommendation that the tree be removed. Um, the fact of the matter is that it, there may be others, but it's only going to happen if people apply. Uh, frankly, I think uh, we need to do this uh, because it's it's people over over a tree. Thank you. Councillor Congerton, you're next. Oh, thank you. Um, to, through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Mr. Coton, um, on the recommendation, number three says um, to write to the resident saying you no longer, uh, to, to, sorry, suggest your vehicle is no longer reversed from the driveway. Is there sufficient room in that driveway, because I haven't been there yet, to find out whether you can actually mo turn the vehicle round so it's got a turning circle inside the property? Mr. Coat? Um, you would struggle to turn in front of the property. You could turn around in the rear of the property. The residents, um, when they've moved in, it does appear that they've installed a gate across the driveway, across, which does prevent them getting access into the into the backyard. But um, yeah, if that gate wasn't there, then it would be possible to, to um, drive, drive into the backyard and turn around and drive out. Yeah, so so I, 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 sorry, just to continue then. So it is, they would have to then drive in their driveway through the gate into their back garden and turn the vehicle around in the back garden and then to come back out forward facing. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct, yeah. And I'll be supporting the removal of the tree too, thank you, Mr. Okay, I've got <laughs> Councillor Johnson, Councillor Kyle, and Councillor Richardson. So, Councillor Johnson, you're next. Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor. I'm not sure who to address this one too, but um, if the uh, if the person who made the deputation uh, sold the house and is no longer living there, um, would it still be valid? Do we? Do, how much weight do we do we put on it? Well, the reason why this has been brought to council is because staff haven't been able to, um, I guess, you know, reach agreement with the satisfactory outcome with the resident. So if a new resident moved in, then um, you know the, the city would be, you know, they obviously would be the request. Yeah. So if we did, yeah. so if we deferred it until a new owner uh, gave, gave us an opinion, that that would be a reasonable thing to do. Is it for sale? Uh, ju just he's sold. <laughs> he's <laughs> moving out. Finish. Cancer, cancer, Carl. You got a question? 
through you, Mayor, I'd just be interested. To, I spoke to the um, owner of the house today, the current owner. Your, your opinion, um, Jim, on planting a tree on the other side of the driveway, which wouldn't interfere with um, the uh, visual amenity. If we remove that tree, can we, and that was the decision of council, can we put a condition in that a tree would go in um, on the other side of the driveway? Mr. Kate? Councillor Richardson, your question? You need to take your mute off, Tenya. No. Tenya, you're, you're muted. You need to take the mute off so we can hear you. Still muted. muted. Remove your mute, mute. Councillor Richardson. I have. That's better. That's now better. we can hear you. That's better. Back on again. Councillors, wanted to, Councillor, you, we can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. And a little bit intermittent. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor and Councillors. Um, I have a question. Can I move? Can I ask that my question be uh, moved into confidential? Can, can I speak confidentially uh, without the public hearing regarding the uh, tree removal? I've got some information that uh, would need to be discussed confidentially. Is in accordance with the act. Well, but if you want to go behind someone, can move, Mr. Mayor. We can move to go behind doors, or we can, um, or we can take it when we go to confidential items, if you wish. Okay, we're now back on. Okay. Any further questions of Ms. Lay? Oh, Mr. Cotton, sorry, Mr. Caton. No. no, we we'll move on. Okay, next item is 5.5, .5, which is um, Mr. Bishop, which is the um, Allenbrook United Football Club. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, councillors. In, in view of the time, I've not, I've got nothing further to add to the report, unless there's any questions on the item. Any questions, councillors, Mr. The Bishop? And Councillor Colley. Uh, Mr. Bishop, are we more? Lo uh, this is once this happens, there'll be a flood. I would imagine of all of these these applications. Is, is that would be that is that the case? Um, no, not necessarily. Uh, this is a particular case to do with um, the problems with the synthetic turf and the fact that that club had to move because of the need to replace that synthetic turf. So it's the special conditions associated with that and the fact they had to relocate for a whole season. It's not just a, a few weeks interruption. Thank you. Now for the questions, uh, Councillor Henderson. Um, just, just in regard to all sporting organisations, do we, are we continuing to rely on them contacting us for their concession uh, in their rates, or are we going to let them know that they're able to apply? So I think that might be best answered by Miss Lay. I, I think there's some correspondence gone to the clubs on that matter, but um, I might have to take it on notice if Miss Lay cannot answer that question. Miss Lay. Yes. Yes. Fees and charges. No. Uh, Mr. Mayor, sorry, a, a point of order here, please. It's it's not on the agenda, and it's like a general question thrown in the middle of it. Yeah, it is a little bit. That is true. No, no further questions of Mr Bishop. Thank you, Mr Bishop. OK, that now takes us to Miss Albright, which is items 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, 6.1 and 6.2. Miss Albright, is there anything you wish to speak to specifically or just take questions? Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Good evening, Councillors. I was just going to give a brief overview of those reports and then take any questions. 
Um, so I'll deal with items 1.2, 1.3 and 1.4 together. So essentially, um, some new legislation came in or amendments to local government act at the end of last year, and they require the council to have two new policies. Those policies are an attendance at events policy and a professional development and training policy. So those are the two new policies that you see there. The other policy that was put up for approval is the allowances and entitlements policy. The only reason that that one is there is because to develop those two new policies, we've had to take those elements out of the existing policy and put them as the basis for the two new policies. So it's just consequential amendments that have been made to the allowances and entitlements policy. It's not, it's not really a change to that fundamental policy. Um, then the Review of Delegations Authority Register, that report is an annual report that's required to Council. We must review our delegations once, once a year. Um, just to note there that we have, we have excluded the delegations that we've just recently changed as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, when the state of emergency is lifted, we will be coming back to Council um, with those delegations at that point. And then the Officer, officer for Auditor General. Um, so last year in about, I think it was May, um, the city was selected as a participant in an OAG audit um, on contract variations and extensions. That audit took place last year and we were given um, preliminary findings against the City of Swan at the end of last year, which were taken to the Audit Committee. And now the OAG has tabled its, its report in Parliament, and that's why this is now coming to Council. So there were four findings in the uh, report from the OAG that were relevant to the City of Swan. Um, we got three moderate ratings and one significant. Um, those are detailed in the, the report. The three that were moderate, one was around our procurement policy and it was essentially asking us to update that policy to include some more information about how we manage contract variations. There was one around our contract register. We are currently, well, sorry, within the last 18 months we moved to a new contract system. And so what that's meant is that we've got contracts that are within two different two different locations and the OAG was looking to us to, us to consolidate those. Um, the third moderate finding was around uh, contract renewals and extensions. We had actually self-reported and so the, uh, we had a non-conformance there and uh, the OAG just noted that non-conformance. <coughs> and then our final finding, which was the one that we need to report to the Minister our action on, is around contract variation. So we had a contract that um, was varied without a, so a waiver was put in place so that we didn't go to tender for a contract variation, but we didn't put a new contract in place. And so that was that was the finding there that we needed to um, more carefully manage our um, our contract variations, particularly where there are large um, changes in the dollar value of the contract. Happy to take any questions. Thank you. Councillor Catalano, you indicated you got a question. Oh, thanks. Um, yes. So, um, what's the limit um, for the um, CEOs, the delegated authority, the CEO, uh, to sign a variation for a disposal of land? What's the what's the what's the um, amount? Is all right. So the delegate to the CEO on variation. So can you tell me where that's actually located in all of these um, documents that have been provided from 6.1? Where, where is it in these here that actually gives the CEO um, the authority, delegated authority, to sign a contract variation, say, of $5 million? So, right. Um, I think it probably isn't there because we're not reviewing the contract delegation So are you saying then that we're not going to be reviewing that? I'm sorry, I, I just need to... I can't understand um, 
how that COVID is going to impact on, on this with the... No, I understand what you're saying. It's just that we haven't put that delegation back up to council for review because we just changed it for the COVID-19... Um, when we did the, when we had special council meetings for the pandemic, this was one of the delegations that we changed. So we're not putting it back up to council now. We will put it back up to council when the state of emergency is lifted. That's, that's all I'm saying. So I don't think it's in the, um, so I can't go and check it with you is what I'm saying. I don't think it's in there right now. Uh, okay, so um, the variation of contracts in terms of um, you know the CEO's ability to sign a contract um, variation for the disposal of land for say five million dollars or uh, thereabouts um, that wasn't included in the auditor general's um, report or was that what was the what was the um, sorry was it the auditor general yeah the auditor general did this report here that you're um, itemised at uh, 6.2. What were the they, were they looking at things like that? Uh, the Auditor General in that report. Is that right? Uh, yes, yeah, they were, they were looking at um, at contract variations in general, and they found that there was I would need to um, I'd need to go and I'd need to follow up with the OED on that one, to be honest. Oh, I great. Don't see why it would have been excluded from their order. Yeah, it'd be great because um, I noticed that there was this significant and also moderate um, issues. There was like four, I believe, um, three moderate um, discrepancies or problem areas, or and then there was one that was significant. And um, it wasn't really that clear to me um, what the three moderate problem areas problems were uh, and I think the significant one can you tell me what the significant one was again? Yes I can but to go into more detail than what I have I'd, I'd love to go behind the closed doors if we could see. Yep. Oh. Okay all right well oh, okay all right then um okay um Okay, I'll, le I'll leave that, that question to then. Um, thanks very much, yep. Um, and I don't know, yeah, that's, that's fine, thank you. Any further questions of Ms Albright? Councillor Henderson. Um, thanks, Mayor. Uh, just to be clear, uh, are these gonna be reviewed again once uh, the restrictions are lifted? Or is this going to be going forward? Ms Albright? <coughs> Sorry, Councillor, is that in relation to item 6.1? Yes. Yes. So when uh, the state of emergency is lifted, we will bring the delegation back for uh, the, the tender review committee, um, the statutory planning and... Um, yep. So, so okay, the, what, what, okay, what I was getting to is that... Um, at the bottom of a large majority of them, um, it's got uh, Mr Foley's name as Chief, Chief Executive Officer. Perhaps it should uh, have a blank there and print name, just in case uh, there's another person. Um, that's across a whole stack of them. You can probably check that out. Um, but I've got a, got a question. Well, Councillor, I am the Chief Executive Officer. And For the these moment. And are viewed every 12 months, so it can't be anyone else's name on because there isn't anyone else at the moment. So, okay, can I be clear then, if, if you've retired yep. and that name is on there, they're just going to cross it still, out, are still they? still valid because it's Chief Executive Officer. All, all the delegations at the are time. to the CEO. Okay, at the time, okay. Yep. <laughs> yes. Um, oh, well, I'm thinking maybe he was going to go fishing. Um, okay, uh, on page 255, can I, can I ask if it's been considered... Um, that uh, on right up the top where it says um, number one, um, has it been considered that this would uh, you have for a period of greater than two weeks other than uh, annual leave? Um, what have I written here? For a period of greater than two weeks other than annual leave, council to determine any 
acting officer um, and for any required period. So in other words, uh, should it be the council that decides uh, after a, a particular period, and I'm suggesting a couple of weeks? That would be up to council to determine. Right. Uh, did, has staff considered that? No, no, generally, because basically I suppose um, my policy has always been it's rotated amongst the executive. So I could be off for a week, I could be off for three weeks, I could be off for two weeks if I got sick. Um, so those arrangements are normally made and we keep a tab on so it's shared amongst all the executives on a rotating basis, depending on, one, who's available. And secondly, if I was something was to happen to me tomorrow, um, there's also a policy in place um, about um, signing of documents. And that depends really on the who's in the office. Thank you, Mr. Foley. I, 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 I get the annual leave rela uh, aspect. I'm, I'm thinking other than that. Yep. And no, no. normally on that basis, it's um, depending on who's available at the time. If something, an emergency happens, I get sick for a couple of days, um, someone else has got to fill in, um, and I'd normally make a phone call to my EA and she'd sort it out pretty quickly. Perhaps I'll discuss this with the CEO, uh, Mayor, because I'm thinking of anything other than the normal, uh, a period of a couple of weeks, and then what, 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 what again, the council again, might Again, then, then that my EA keeps a list and we just go through and whoever's available and is normally the one who hasn't done the longest for a while norm normally takes the job. Thanks, Mayor. Okay. Any further questions of Ms. Albright? Councillor Kellano. Yes, yeah, sorry. Just to go back to the um, the CEO, um, the delegated authority for the CEO to sign a contract variation for disposal of land of, you know, a large sum of money, let's say $5 million, and sign a contract variation. Um, so you say that... Can you that's a page in... there, Councillor Catalano, please, that you're referring to? Sorry? Can you use a page in the report you're referring to? No, well, that's why I don't, I don't see it in the report. That's why I'm asking about it. You see, I, that's why I'm having a problem with it, because I don't see it in the report. And I just wanted to know where that delegated authority is. And I think um, Ms Albrecht said that it had been changed due to COVID. Is that right? Uh, through you, Ms Mayor. Sorry, not, not entirely, Councillor Kevin, but I have actually found that I wasn't oh, sure if we included Fantastic. it. Fantastic. Oh, good. Fantastic. Page 248. 248. That's right, yeah. And that, what does that mean when it's all blanked out like that? Because I assume that that means that that's been changed. No, so what, we, what, we're, what we're saying is we, we are not putting that up to you for review at the moment because we thought it would be confusing if we were to put that up to review it in light of COVID-19. We have to review it again at the end of the state of emergency, so we've excluded it from our review at this time. But if you have a look at the statutory power delegated, it says that Regulation 21A, varying a contract, has been delegated to the CEO. That's what that delegation says. Okay, thanks. So and the current delegation that is in place. Great, thank you. And one last question. Will this be coming up for review after the COVID is over? Or is this just going to carry on? Yes. It'll come up for no, review? We'll bring, these, we'll bring these back to you after the... To uh, council. To council. Sure. Thank you. Thanks very much. No further questions, Ms Albright. Thank you, councillors. That now takes us to the confidential items and just move to go behind closed doors. Councillor Perry.